little bit of a souvenir from Maryland of the Human Computer Interaction Lab uh, T-shirt in our bright green. So it goes with your usability green leaf. Thank, Thank you for hosting me here. And I guess I'll just at least show you the Maryland cap. So we're very proud uh, of the relationship of Maryland with Google. Uh, of course, Sergey Brin was one of our graduates in 1993. Uh, his father is a professor of math uh, at Maryland, and Sergey graduated from Maryland. He did go to Stanford, didn't graduate from there, but he, he is a graduate of Maryland. So we're pleased by all that. And uh, I'm pleased with the connections to uh, Google, and those have been expanded recently. Thanks, Dan Russell, for his help in making some of those connections get stronger. Um, and I'm a professor of computer science and doing traditional database file design optimization techniques as my early work, but I've grown up to uh, do something a little bit different and cross over to the side of uh, integrating psychology with the computing. And I'm proud of the 28-year-old or 28-year-young Human Computer Interaction Laboratory uh, that's interdisciplinary, shared between the College of uh, the Computer Science Department and the College of Information Studies, but also has these wonderful other connections around campus with different departments, including the wonderfully titled Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, MYTH. Uh, and so you can visit our website, more than 600 papers, uh, 200 videos, uh, um, 40 pieces of software, and so on. And we'll take a look, a visual look a little bit later at some of the uh, representation of those tech reports. I hope some of you know me from Designing the User Interface. The book uh, uh, first edition was in 1986. And uh, it's grown and changed and tried to represent what happened. And my collaborator for the fourth and fifth editions is Catherine Plaisant, who's been working with me as a researcher for more than 20 years. And this fifth edition represents uh, a substantial change, uh, even from the times of the fourth edition, when YouTube was just getting started, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter was uh, not even an idea. Uh, and and uh, now we have five billion cell phone users and a remarkable transformation where the social media are bridging out to be uh, ever more impactful. Uh, so a lot of our effort has shifted towards studying these social media and trying to understand the complex networks that are embedded uh, in these social media with the goal, of course, of facilitating the beneficial outcomes and limiting the negative ones the malicious attacks, uh, the, the use for uh, nefarious purposes uh, endangers the whole venture of social media, and yet the attractions are very strong, and that's where we're going to go today. And I'm going to focus narrowly on the use of information visualization and analysis for understanding uh, these uh, uh, complex networks. So uh, we had started in this book, now 12 years old, uh, tried to define the topic, uh, and it had the subtitle given by my co-authors Stu Card and Jack Mac uh, Jock McInlay uh, to call it Using Vision to Think. That is, your eyes are not just input devices, but they're ways of solving problems, that the optic nerve and uh, you, your mind is well designed to, in a few hundred milliseconds, pick out trends, clusters, gaps, and outliers, if the visual representations are appropriate in terms of color, size, shape, and proximity. So the remaining set of challenges, people are getting better at understanding this. The, the topic of scientific visualization has been around for 50 years, but information visualization only about 16 or 18 years by way of the conferences that use that title. Uh, visual analytics has grown up in the last six years as a major topic, and it really provides a encompassing view where information visualization is usually seen as the technology, but there's a framework of getting the problem, getting the data, choosing the hypotheses, working on the insights, developing an understanding, preparing a decision, making a presentation. And so that's the sort of the end-to-end the -end effort. Uh, I'll sort of start by showing off a little, at uh, risk of showing off a little, but this was done by somebody else, Katty Borner at Indiana University. These are all the papers in the world of InfoViz as of the 2004 collection of papers. And what you see here, the authors, the number of papers they wrote is the size of their, um, uh, their circles. And you see the number of co-authorships, very tight working group of that, my partners from Park, uh, Jock McInlay, Stu Card, and George Robertson, who subsequently went to 
Microsoft, and there's my circle. Um, and I work with lots of students. So that's the difference between an industrial research group that's stable, funded, and produces good work over many years, and an academic group which has a lot of traveling people who come and go. Among them, you may see Martin Wattenberg, who I work with, who's now working at Google. Uh, and I, he's out there somewhere, but uh, I'm sure he's probably writing good code and trying to take the good ideas he's developed um, and put them to work for Google. You may also notice other familiar names like Mark Weiser, who was a faculty member at Maryland before he went to Park and uh, did a lot of uh, important work there, but a lot of people you'll see around here. You can also distinguish the clusters that may be relevant or interesting uh, to you. There's the Carnegie Mellon Bunch over here. Um, we have uh, Univ uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, you have uh, a University of Minnesota. There's Georgia Tech. You come to know these and finding the meaningful clusters becomes one of the natural things that you want to do. So this slide is sort of the motivator for the idea of thinking about networks and deriving visual analytics from a single graphic design. Now, of course, you're going to apply statistical methods as well to not only develop the visualization, but confirm the kind of hypotheses that you might be getting from these visualizations. Uh, that book, the InfoViz book, brings the link between myself and CARD and Mac. All right, so just a further few words about information visualization, few examples, and then my main focus today is about network visualization using the tool that we've developed over the last four years called Node XL. So I, I hope visualization's well in place here, uh, but uh, to push it along, you know, there's uh, the, the companies that got started five and 10 years ago, got bought by the medium-sized companies, and then the medium ones by the big companies. Google bought Gapminder, and maybe other visualization companies that I don't know about, but there's been a whole cascade of the purchase and the integration of visualization into many companies. Our own work was by way of Spotfire. Any Spotfire users here? All right, great. Um, and Spotfire uh, was the work of myself and Chris Olberg and published in Chi Conference of 1994, remains one of the most highly cited papers in that literature. And he formed the company in 97. I was part of the board of directors for five years. It grew to 200 people and was bought in 2007 by TIBCO. It remains probably the premier visualization tool and, it, and this slide encompasses a rather simple version, which shows you one of its features, the guide, where the author here, Nick Thomas, wrote a little explanation of what's here and provided some guidelines by which you could do further analyses. The multiple coordinated windows uh, are, are linked, a 3D scattergram, a heat map over here, a plate map over here. And the significant discovery here what that Nick Thomas made from this slide was the unusual or surprising activity of the RBP1 gene, which was not known to be as active. And it's important because it influences retinol and retinol in turn influences embryonic development and vision. The other aspects of the sort of standard visualization toolkits are sets of sliders and controls. Here are the double box sliders that we call dynamic queries and have propagated into lots of places, but not everywhere. They're still not part of standard toolkits, but they're widely used on web applications and others, some of which I'll show. Um, and so the sort of basic ideas were, uh, were put in place, but Spotfire is a high-end tool used by you know, a lot of ambitious organizations, intelligence and analysis. Its main success story was pharmaceutical drug discovery. All 25 of the leading pharma companies use that as their process for weeding out the 100,000 pharmaceutical compounds into the three that they're going to run uh, clinical trials on. And so um, that kind of process at a company like Pfizer has like 3,000 people who use Spotfire in rather systematic ways, similar for AstraZeneca or Novartis and so on. Uh, but visualizations used in lots of places and getting more pixels is uh, the desirable thing. As I walked around the floor here, I saw people with two large displays each. That's probably about right. But getting higher resolution, we've moved towards, you know, larger, not larger in inches, but larger in pixels so that we can get more on the screen and read them carefully without having to move your body too far left or right um, and still be able to read all the text but when the detail gets uh, rich and interesting, you can see it all there at once. Uh, so these larger displays are a growing fascination for some people and 
actually growing benefit from it. Also, visualization on small displays is uh, becoming an important topic. And so people are looking for the ways to be able to explore data on uh, megapixel or smaller displays. So the lessons we learned in that 10-year process um, was are summarized in this uh, uh, phrase that I playfully labeled as the mantra. And I wrote it in a paper just like this, you know, 10 copies of it or 12, 10 copies, where each line represented a project where we struggled for weeks or months uh, to come up with a design. And it was overview first, show the user the whole data set, whether it's a million or a billion items, see the whole data set, see the whole board, where is the data clustered, where are the outliers, where are the anomalies, okay? And then allow the user to zoom in on what they want, filter out what they don't want, and then click for details on demand. That became the principle. And the application of this principle uh, went through a variety of domains. So the scientific visualization I've mentioned has been around a long time, but it had a very different flavor than these newer InfoViz uh, problems. The SciViz problems were meant to show two and three dimensional worlds, and the question was where? Where does the constriction in the arteries influence blood circulation? Where is the turbulence greatest in the airflow over the wing of an aircraft? And you wanted to know things were left or right or up or down or east or west or inside or outside. By contrast, InfoViz is a very different uh, uh, set of problems and it's not so much where, but you get a new set of questions. So. I've talked about multivariate data, which is what Spotfire and its competitors now like Tableau. Um, there's a variety of other tools out there. <clears throat> they try to show you when you have high dimensional data sets, a set, a series of multiple two dimensional uh, projections to give you an understanding of what the relationships, what the clusters, gaps, outliers might be. For temporal data, you might have patterns that rise, stock market information, gene expression data, and, you know, when Google goes up, does Microsoft go up or does Microsoft go down? Or does Apple go up or down? Is there a relationship that might be interesting, that might be useful, that might be significant? Uh, so that is most commonly seen in temporal data that has continuous values like stock market closing prices. But as I'll show you, we also look at <clears throat> places where there's categorical data like patient event histories. Patients are admitted to a hospital. Uh, they have a surgery, they get treated, they receive a medication, um, they're sent home. And trying to track the patterns in uh, categorical event streams like web log data, uh, we think is a significant and important problem. <clears throat> Tree structure data um, is another common space. I'm going to show that quickly. But my main focus today is network data. So just to motivate the idea of information visualization, I give you this little challenge. Anscombe was a statistician at Princeton University, and he developed this little example, 12 lines uh, of 12 data points in four, um, in four uh, groups. And I'll just pause a moment and ask you, do you see anything interesting in these four groups? This little audience participation here. Uh, there's a big outlier in four, and I think you're pointing out to this 19 here, right? That one stands out. How did you catch that? Very, uh, visually it's visually distinct, right? It wasn't just that the number was distinct. If that was seven, I think you would have had a hard time, or six maybe, you would have had a hard time seeing it. All the other ones here are eight, which you might comment on also. Anything else? Anybody see anything interesting? Very good. Column, the X columns in one, two, and three are exactly the same. So that takes a while to spot that. Can you give me a, would you be able to draw these curves? Be a little tough, a little to take a while. You probably could, but it would take a while. So you say, I'm a statistician. I can do data mining. I can do statistics. So you're going to apply statistics, mean standard deviation, and variance, correlation coefficient, they're all the same. So the point of this, you know, of Anscombe's quartet was that the statistics don't always tell you what's happening and that the blind application of statistical methods and data mining and machine learning is not enough. Uh, these four are not special. There are 40 more 
or 400 million more that I could create that would have the same statistical properties. Okay, and so it may be helpful to look at them. And if you take a look in a few hundred milliseconds, you ready? One, two, three. There we go. You immediately grasp and potentially will remember what each of these patterns are about. Uh, the first one being a sort of low linear positive correlation. The second being a very high correlation quadratic in nature, though. And then the third one, a straight linear correlation with one outlier or anomaly. I would call it an anomaly. Um, outliers are usually defined as three standard deviations from mean in a normal distribution, but I almost never get to see a normal distribution. Uh, and so, you know, having uh, something weird like this uh, indicates probably, I would say, an error in the data. And I would say the, you know, visualization is beneficial even if you only use it for data cleaning. The majority of data sets that people bring to me in my office have something wrong with them that people just don't know about. Uh, it may, you know, I had uh, uh, 6,400 hospital admissions uh, or hospital emergency room visits and the age was recorded and studied by male and female admitted and sent home, insurance, non-insurance. It turned out three of those patients had, were 999 years old and nobody knew it. And they run the data, you know, analysis on that. Other cases, I had a year's worth of data uh, given to me, a time series data, but April was missing and they never knew this, okay? Other cases, <clears throat> a few hundred lines of data <clears throat> and 41 lines were copied exactly the same twice in the data set. So the data sets we get to see have a lot of varied kind of errors and the visualization will help you understand. Um, I'm not gonna do demos here, uh, but we could take a look or you can download for free. We've worked on time series data um, that looks like stock market data or others and finding peaks and valleys, finding stable portions, finding growing uh, ranges were all things that we're able to do in a very systematic way by visual presentation. <clears throat> we extended this in Time Searcher 2, also free to download, so that you could look at tens of thousands of points, even on a, mega, on, on a thousand point wide display, and search for common patterns. Here we're looking at some weather data in Italian cities. So we're looking at the sunlight. This is over a five year period. You can see the seasonal variations. And here's a two month period selected. Uh, from the end of August to the end of October. That's expanded over here. We've got two cloudy days and seven sunny days in between. We search for patterns like that, and the triangles in the overview show me where those things occur, and I can go looking for things that are similar. We also look for patterns, as I mentioned, in temporal event sequences. This is our sort of hot breakthrough area these days, although this early example goes back uh, now more than 10 years of looking at patient visits to physicians, hospitalizations, uh, lab tests, uh, then medications. And so if you click on the sonogram, you see the sonogram. There's the fetus. If you click on the x-ray, you'll get to see the x-ray. And the today line shows you where we are. This patient is pregnant and is predicted to be pregnant for another two, three months, has been diagnosed as having diabetes, receiving insulin, increased dose of insulin, and last licks to counteract the side effects. So getting an overview of a patient in one screen rather than 150 pages of documentation is proving to be a significant advantage. Uh, and as we move to electronic medical records, that's become a big issue for us in trying to study how to build the right kind of designs. We've also taken on the problem, if I have a million or 10 million patients, how do I find patterns? And so. Each of these rows here represents one patient, and here we were looking for radiology contrast patterns, <clears throat> and the pattern we were looking for was low creatinine before the radiology injection, and then high creatinine afterwards. We were able to find that in a group of some 4,000 patients, find the 151 who had this particular pattern of behavior. So, uh, again, free to download, Lifelines 2, and I don't think I have it here, but the new tool, which is really a breakthrough on top of this called Life Flow, lets you look, even if you have a million of any kind of event sequences, you can see them on the screen in a single screen. And that's proven to be a huge payoff, um, and we're working on a variety of applications for that, mainly medical, 
Um, but we've just received support from Oracle to go after that and expand that uh, topic as well. Okay, um, I can't resist showing you some tree maps. If you haven't seen the tree map idea, this goes back now some 20 years, and that was our tree map for the gene ontology, which was 14,000 genes in a 23 level hierarchy. I hope you're more familiar with Martin Wattenberg's uh, tree map of smart money um, market map done in 1999. I was a consultant for uh, that, uh, for, for working with them at the time. Um, and each of the companies uh, has a rectangle whose size is a, a function of the uh, market capitalization. And the color indicates green means it's rising, red means it's falling. They're organized into 11 industry groups, healthcare, financial, energy, technology, and then broken down into two more levels of hierarchy so you can zoom in on those. And one day, this is what the market looked like. So here's another bad day for the market. Pretty red. Anybody see anything interesting? Yeah, I see some fingers pointing. If you take a moment, it won't take you long even... You know, whoops, uh, it won't take you long to see there's one bright green dot. It's not just a little green, it's bright green. And when I click on that, as you, you click on any one of these stocks, you get a 20 year trading history and a mountain of data about their uh, previous transactions, uh, insider trading and so on. And that green dot was uh, the AMP trading company, which that day had bought the Pathmark chain of grocery stores. They were up 6% when everybody else was down. Uh, and so I like this slide because it makes the point about visualization, which is that it gives you answers to questions you didn't know you had. Okay, it, things leap out when your eye becomes trained to use this, and it does take a little training to understand and see the hierarchical structure in this two-dimensional space-filling, space-limiting uh, representation. Other days, the patterns are a little more subtle. Green, mostly green for technology, mostly green for energy, mostly green for financial with a few, mostly red for financial, and mostly red for healthcare, except one out over there. Uh, so you can begin to discern these patterns. I like this one, which was a green day, if you like happier news. And, oh, sorry, over here, uh, we see the contrarian gold stocks go differently. When the market's up, the, the gold stocks go down, typically. Not always, but that's a pattern I've come to understand. And others, you know, basic materials, defense industries are over here, and so on. Google over here, I've come to know where the favorites are over time. You can do this. This is free at smartmoney.com slash market map. Um, this was an interesting one not too long ago uh, when the market was pretty green, but Sprint had a huge decline of 16%. That's a lot for one day. And does anybody remember why that happened? Right, AT&T bought, um, what did they buy? They bought T-Mobile, right? So that was bad news for Sprint and it tumbled you know, badly on that day. So you can be, if you know enough of the background domain knowledge, you can begin to uh, understand what's going on. And that's kind of the power of these tools. Others have done tree maps of many kinds. This is Marcos Westcamp's news map, which shows all the world's news based on the Google News Aggregator. It simply takes the values from the Google News Aggregator, shows them uh, here US only, organized by world news, international, national, technology, sports, entertainment, health. And then you can compare US to UK, Spain, Netherlands, Mexico, or 20 different countries. So you can see how a story plays in one country versus another. Uh, this is what I just added last week, was the uh, Encyclopedia of Life project you may know about. It's uh, two million species on planet Earth, and the idea is to get a web page for every one of them and get photographs and data, scientific data for every one of them as a kind of Wikipedia project. And of course, it takes from Wikipedia, but this was the way they organized, or one of the ways they organized by a tree map. So I think chordata are where humans are, right? Am I right? The chordata are spine and then all these other and you can see the number of species represents the uh, the uh, size um, spotfire added tree maps a few years ago and that's become a regular staple and very useful part of that uh, 
uh, that tool extending its value. New York Times began using tree maps in 2007 and continues to do that for a variety of applications, including the sort of more esoteric ones like the Voronoi tree map, a nice invention of a German uh, researcher named Michael Bolzer, who within a year of publishing it, appears in the New York Times to show the uh, consumer price index in a more organic take a look and form. Uh, for scalability, there's a million node tree map. It uh, shows all the uh, files and directories and the servers in the Computer Science Department of Maryland. And there's an hour's worth of discussion of insights here, but this large gray area was about 7% of the storage space that was being not garbage collected and was you know just wasted space, which was a surprise. Other obvious things are three large directories that had triple you know, were simply copied and shouldn't been. There's other places where there's six copies of the same directories and a variety of other interesting things. Okay, so that's all the preface. Here's what the talk's about today, analyzing social media. Um, and I choose Manuel Lima's uh, page, ironically entitled Visual Complexity, where he has cataloged some more than 700 ways of showing networks. And they are many very beautiful, uh, but many very tangled bowls of spaghetti, as they're often called. And so while they may look pretty, they don't always provide you the kind of insights you're after. So we began to develop our own strategies, and this, the PhD work of Adam Perrer, uh, called Social Action, which we still use, and it integrates statistical methods with a search process, a visual analytics process called Systematic Yet Flexible, and gives you control over the, um, over the visualization. Now I'm gonna show one little video of its use. This is my favorite one minute uh, uh, story. Uh, shows the Senate voting data for the year 2007. Uh, the red Republicans and the blue Democrats. And every senator is connected to every other senator by a link. So there's about 5,000 links here. The strength of each link is the number of times they voted the same way. Okay, the number of times. There were 330 roll call votes, and the most similar votes were Cardin and Mikulski, who you may know are both are Maryland senators. They voted the same way 303 times. And then we go down to 95, 285, down to you know, 100 or so. We use the fruchterman rheingold layout algorithm, and we start jiggling around, and we're now going to start filtering out the low-value ones, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150. So those who aren't that similar to the others break out, and McCain, who was running for president, didn't vote enough times to be similar to anybody, okay? And then you get this remarkable, unbelievable, oh, too-good-to-be-true uh, visualization. Brownback was running for president, and he drifts off separately. And you just, you know, it's just amazingly, uh, you, you get this nice, uh, strong separation uh, going on here. And I'm going to stop it right here just to draw attention to a few things. Um, you do see the Democrats have a strong group and the two independents, Lieberman and Sanders, they may call themselves independent, but they're pretty much Democrat and Sanders very much so, very far from the Republican positions. And way out on the side, are Dodd, Biden, Kerry, and Obama. Okay, this is before Obama went more center. He was far from the Republican positions. Now in the middle, you have Olympia Snow of Maine, Arlen Specter, Pennsylvania, Susan Collins, uh, and those three, as you can see, get sometimes close to the Democrats. In fact, those are the three senators who two years later, in January 2009, voted in favor of the stimulus bill with the uh, 50 uh, Democratic uh, senators. So that was a pretty strong, compelling result here um, and that, that showed you know, this remarkable, I didn't expect this strong separation, uh, but there it was, and yet you could see somehow these crossover patterns which really leap out at you. Any question about this? Do you see this? Do you understand what you're looking at? I'm gonna continue rolling it and we're going to freeze the topology, turn off Fruchterm and Rheingold, and now continue filtering to get rid of the similarities that are 190, 200, 210, 220, and the really very similar voting patterns. And now you see another remarkable pattern emerging. 
Um, and there it is. The Republicans during that voting season had lost their party cohesion, whereas the Democrats were still pretty well connected, although Dodd, Biden, Kerry, and Obama were not connected to the Democratic mainstream. If you do a deeper analysis, you'll find that this linkage is tied up a lot with a group of Midwestern Democratic senators who caucus together and often vote as a bloc. Within the Republicans, there's, a, there's one left. So any algorithm that was looking for no connection wouldn't have found it, but there's one of Isaacson and Chambliss who still have a connection there. But as you can see, the Republican Party did not have their cohesion. Others have since followed up and done other years going back in time, forward in time, and this has become a sort of standard method. Uh, Chris Wilson was the journalist who brought this to us for Slate magazine, and he wrote about it in Slate with Adam Perrer as well. Any questions about this before I leave it? Again, I want to sort of you know, convey to you that when you do have the right layouts, when you do have the right organization of information, then the insights essentially leap out at you. It does take some training and getting your eye accustomed to what the normal patterns are, but once you do that, you really can begin to make these discoveries that can be significant. Okay. So uh, we did that. That was Adam Perra's work. We still use social action as part of other tools. Uh, but uh, today I wanted to take you down the path and talk about the social media analysis. And I liken it to footprints in the sand, that here's a social media of walking on the beach. Uh, and, you know, with a little skill, you could begin to read these. Which direction are they walking? Uh, is it a young person, an old person? Are they heavy? Are they light? Are they walking together? Did the same pair of footprints return two hours later? Are they walking a dog? What's going on? You know, how long did it... So we are just beginning to learn how to interpret or track these social media. And the tool we've been building for four years is called Node Excel. It's embedded inside Excel 207 and 2010. Sorry to say that means it runs on the PC side, the Mac, even 2011. Uh, version of Excel does not have the foundational tools we need. So uh, we'll have to work on that and get that to, to happen. So the idea is very simple. In the spreadsheet side, you just put, you know, Anne invited Bob, Bob invited Carol, Carol invited Dave, and so on. And then you say, you know, if you can make us, if you can make a bar chart or a pie chart, you can make a, you can make a network drawing. And it will draw the network. Uh, and then you can change the visual properties and make the girls pink and the boys blue and add labels, etc. Uh, if you do the Senate voting data, it works very nicely. It comes with the tool when you download it. It's free to download, open source and free. Um, and so you can do the Senate uh, voting. And there again, we have Specter, Collins and Snow right in the middle uh, in, in this case. Okay, so I just want to give you a little tour of the p possibilities to tantalize you. The copies of the books on the table here uh, give you more details and show you how to do it, motivate it, and then walk you through the application in many different places. Part of Node Excel's charm is the importers, or as we call them, spigots, that let you import your email, import your you know Flickr, Twitter, YouTube. Facebook, a variety of other uh, sources, and we're working with a variety of publishers and organizations who want to create spigots either for their internal use or to publish uh, you know, within the Node Excel framework or sometimes an independent one. So uh, the Voson system lets you map websites. It sucks, you give it a seed of whatever 10 or 15 websites and it will fan out and collect all the network connections of a set of websites and then you can browse them uh, in uh, Node Excel. Uh, the particular charm is the Twitter importer, which has become very hot. And I'm going to show you a bunch of tw the Twitter streams and then show you a bunch of other applications. This is one of our early ones at NYU, just a few blocks from here. September 2009, there was a conference at the business school called a Workshop on Information in Networks. And about 80 people assembled, and there was a real feeling there was a bunch of sociologists talking over here and a bunch of computer scientists over there. And my buddy Mark Smith went to the Twitter stream and downloaded all the tweets that had the hashtag win09. And sure enough, when you plot the follower and followers network, you find the sociologists right over here. 
and you find the computer scientists right over here, and one MIT graduate student as the bridge between them. It was a very encouraging and fortuitous initial discovery that we were able to find this uh, pretty interesting pattern. Some of you may recognize sociologists like Barry Wellman, a sort of important figure in the field. They're sized by the number of uh, followers they have. Uh, so, you know, we've done this over the few years. This is the World Wide Web 2010 conference, a very different pattern, somewhat larger one, where you can see it's a very cohesive group. These people all know each other quite well and follow each other. Uh, they're a large group. On the bottom, we put up the people who are not connected. So only about 5% of the group were not connected. This is a very different pattern, and this nexus of tight connections over here um, shows a well-organized, coherent group that actually talks to each other. By 2011, we had polished our techniques still further, and so we were able to apply clustering algorithms and then put the different groups into separate boxes whose size was determined by the number of, uh, uh, of, of nodes in each, uh, in each box. And so you get a set of researchers, including our own Jimmy Lin over here, sized by the number of followers. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee has got a big set of followers, so he's over here. But some of his collaborators you may know, Jim Hendler and Nigel Shadbolt, have a separate group. The Brazilians were over here and we're able to discern patterns, and I'll show you, you know, some other examples of those, of how we began to be able to organize and present the information instead of a bowl of spaghetti into meaningful ways. You could see clusters and groups and outliers. Um, this is an- So Ben, yeah. can I interrupt real quick? Yeah, I got ahead. a quick question about that one. Yeah. Go back one. Right, there you are. The boxes, the boxes are interesting but they have no apparent connection to the obvious underlying structure of the visualization. How did you get the boxes? Um, the, if you look within each box, all the nodes are the same color. So we apply a clustering algorithm to it, and we have several embedded in Node Excel. So we'll do the clustering for you. And then um, you've got one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight clusters here. And then we'll draw the boxes to include uh, where the size, the biggest one's in the upper left, and it's the most number of nodes in this selection from Twitter. Uh, in this case, we did, I don't like, I, 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 this one's a little messy because it allows, it shows the edges that go across the boxes as well. I'll show you another one later where it, you know, doesn't have, we, we, there's a, there's a checkbox where you can eliminate the edges that go across the boxes so you can look at the, 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 the structure within each cluster. So, uh, Dan, does that explain it? It's a pretty nice yeah, feature. Good, uh, I, I, okay, I, I assume that there's a way to actually create a cluster that follows that dramatic diagonal stripe, the sort of the, the light from the god of uh, sun god up there in the, in the center, yeah. uh, radiating and down Tim, to the lower Tim, Tim Berners-Lee. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, it's Tim Berners-Lee. <laughs> So he's got, yeah. this is the yeah. way it's going out. These are his close collaborators. The clustering algorithm actually put them in a separate cluster, not together with him, uh, which is, you know, that's the way clustering algorithms go. But you can see there's a preponderance. He's connected to these people very well. And, you know, Jim Handler, Nigel Shadbolt, and others, I, I can't see them right now. Uh, but we tend to do these on, you know, 3K by 4K displays. On uh, Mark's Flickr website, you can download the full original one of these and take a look at reading the labels. Um, is that an, is that get you what you want? We we do drop that's, all the singletons um, that didn't you know in a separate bin over here, and you know so we're able to discern. We did a nice one with with soccer teams, and they had interesting patterns. So this kind of fun. I'll show you another one in a little while. But this features our hot new feature, and we're just writing a paper on this. Um, so this group in a box idea uh, turns out to be, I think, a very significant way of doing layout better. When you do this by straight Fruchterm and Rheingold, you really can't see much. But when you throw them into clusters and then group and then into the boxes, it really opens up your understanding. All right. Um, this was a simple one uh, where we searched on the term HCI, and you can see it's has two actual clusters. This one is actually, instead of human-computer interaction, is human capital index. 
And then all of these people are people we knew, including Ed Chi, who's just joined. Is Ed over there? Uh, but Ed's joined Google now as well. And then this huge one, we size by the number of followers, is RKMT. Some of you may know him. It's Jun Rekimoto, who's the head of the Sony Computer Science Lab in Tokyo. And I sent him a note, and I said, June, how did you get 160,000 followers? Uh, and he said, well, at one point, he was a recommended follower. And so he got you know, 160,000 followers. Uh, that's way beyond anyone else uh, you know, that, uh, in this community. Although Abdur Chudhuri of Twitter has, of course, uh, even more than that. Um, so this showed you a structure, a less well-developed structure. And a lot of singletons, a lot of people, and a lot of, you know, mention HCI in a variety of circumstances, but they're not connected up as a group. The community of HCI is not well structured, okay? On the other hand, the CHI 2010 community did have a pretty good structure, and here we're showing it in yet a different way, uh, where we have the number of followers and number of tweets uh, logarithmically on the sides there. And it's pretty clear there's this strong cluster in the middle and a dramatic outlier, um, and that is Zephoria. Some of you may know her, Dana Boyd. She's a senior researcher for Microsoft, uh, but uh, she has the most number of followers, even though she doesn't have the most number of tweets. Uh, but her tweets are interesting to read, and a lot of people, about 45,000 people, follow uh, Dana Boyd. Um, and, uh, you know, care about what she says. The place you want to be is below the diagonal. Uh, my buddy Mark Smith's right over here. Uh, he gets uh, attended to quite well. Uh, at this point, I was only a moderately active Twitter uh, person. I'm over here, still below the diagonal. That's a good place to be. The ones above the diagonals we call losers uh, because <laughs> they, they tweet a lot, but nobody listens, really. And over here is this voice bot. Um, which is, you know, they tweets a lot, but nobody listens. Uh, so you can begin to see these patterns of what's going on. That tweet, right, if, so if you tweet at a forest, is anybody here, right. So this is another way you can begin to look at the data, and Node Excel lets you represent the XY position as well. Now, we began to study controversial communities. So last year, the oil spill was a controversial topic, and it's oil spill sort of a open term, so a lot of people talked about it, but were not connected to anybody. In fact, I would say more than 50% of the people were not in any organized group. But here we see the pattern of controversy. You have one group that's well connected here, which is USA Today and NPR and other climate-related groups, whereas the group below are the climate skeptics. So they provide a different you know, perspective. They're well connected, and only a few bridging uh, edges that take them across. So this concern about polarization in the political sphere is often raised, and you can see it lightly over here and more dramatically in this case, which was in January. We began to do work on the political issues. And so just the tweet, uh, the, the keyword GOP, uh, grand old party, for those who don't know, or the Republican Party, but all the tweets that had GOP in them. And then we used the clustering algorithm and the layout to produce this dramatic and very stereotypic picture of controversy. You have one large cluster, which we, we made red, which are all the Republicans who do are well connected with each other. And then the people who were saying negative things about GOP and we painted them blue, they were the Democrats. They're a smaller bunch in this case, not a surprise because we searched for the term GOP. Um, and so you do get some bridging things. And the largest node, here we rank by the between a centrality metric, is over here, Politico, which is the political blog uh, in Washington. And it's followed both by Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the clustering algorithm did uh, paint it uh, with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the blue Democrats, but it's, as you can see, a good bridging organization. These others are highly conservative. The high between the centrality groups otherwise, beyond that, are, are very cons are conservative groups. And we've repeated this for the Pew Internet and American Society uh, doing a study of the State of the Union address and the tweets related to Obama 
pro and negative, and then the follow on Michelle Bachman and Paul Ryan um, presentations that followed. So that's about to appear. Uh, it'll be on the Pew Internet site soon. So uh, we're, we're getting to understand how to take this rich stream of social media data and be able to ex filter it in a way, get an overview, then filter and zoom in on the key things that are important that could lead to interesting decisions. Uh, here's another sort of great example of the clustering. Um, on Flickr, uh, we took all the tags uh, that had the word mouse in them and then did the cluster and layout and you find a yellow group over here which is the computer uh, mouse and the blue group which is the animal mouse and the red group which is Mickey Mouse. And these are pictures that uh, come from each of those. So clearly you can see the mouse there. So this is what natural language processing people would usually describe as word sense disambiguation. And here we're showing that you can do that often just by the network analysis of common occurrence of terms. So that was sort of a nice idea. Here I show you my personal Flickr. It's a little washed out on this display, but um, you can see there's two natural groups here. On the right hand side is my family, my two daughters, Anna and Sarah. There are 28 pictures in which I appear with Anna, 25 with daughter Sarah, 39 of them together, and Sarah got married a few years ago to Mark, and I have 93 pictures of them together. And my sister's here with her uh, husband and children, and then other cousins are over here. On the professional side, the lab uh, people, Catherine Plaisant and uh, Jenny Priest and Ben Peterson, Allison Druin, all those appear in one cluster, and a few other of our close buddies like George Robertson and Jacob Nielsen also got colored green. Uh, then another bunch, Austin Henderson, Wendy Kellogg, John Thomas uh, was another group. And then you'll see other people who I often photograph at uh, Kai conferences. Terry Winograd may be familiar to some of you and a variety of other people. But the clustering structure and algorithms are very powerful to tease out structure in complex networks. Uh, this was done by a student just this semester as part of a homework assignment, but it was so nice I wanted to include it here. Um, he took the 600 tech reports from the HCL website, downloaded them, scraped them all, put them into a co-occurrence, um, a co-authorship network, and you can see that um, within that community of 600 papers, Catherine Plaisant and I have written a lot of papers together. But she has lots of other groups that she works with separately. There's some groups and people we've worked with together, uh, and there are other groups that I've worked with on my own. Similarly, Allison Druin and Ben Peterson work closely together. Uh, they're a little younger, so maybe fewer papers, but Peterson has his own group, and Allison has lots of people. One of Allison's students is right here as well. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you're, were you the co author? You're looking, were you co author of one of the papers there? But sometimes they work together. On the other hand, there's very few papers, or in fact, there's no paper where we are all together. And if you tease out by filtering a little bit more and look for only the links where there's at least five co authored papers, you see an even more distinct pattern here um, where Catherine and I are linked by the work we've done together. Here, color represents the age or the number of years we've been part of the lab. Uh, so Peterson and Drew in our newer. Only Anne Rose, who works in our lab, has collaborated with all of us. Okay. So we have pretty much, you know, independent bunches. I've worked with Peterson, you know, on some things, um, but I've never written a paper with Allison Drew. Okay. Or I haven't written five anyway. Um, and you can see some other patterns, which we'd like to show even more strongly. These three should be together as a group because they have the same relationship. And similarly over here, Kang, Zhao, and Marcionini have the same relationship, uh, but these others have a different one. These others would, perform, would, would produce a fan. We'd like to put them together in a group. So we're still working on the ways to more clearly represent uh, the relationships that are important that your eye can pick them out in a second instead of 10 seconds. Um, Francois Grimbertier, one of Terry Winograd's students, uh, spent a few years at Maryland, but 
uh, did not publish a lot with the rest of us. He was pretty much more independent. Okay. And um, the one I just grabbed yesterday to show you, we're studying the Nation of Neighbors, which is a community safety system. Uh, it's got 160 communities around the country. And we were looking at the postings among the different, uh, within the different groups. So we had all of that data. And it was, when we looked at it just in Fruchterman and Rheingold or, or you know, Harold Korn layouts, there was just kind of a mess. So we threw it into the group in the box thing. And lo and behold, it showed a pretty strong structure here. And we, left, we, we eliminated the links across them. So the, the post and the response pattern uh, stands out very apparently here. The biggest ones in the upper left and then all the small ones in the lower right. But you quickly get a very memorable understanding of the pattern that uh, of relationships within these uh, within these groups. Okay, uh, so I just close by saying that's the book, and there are copies here in New York, uh, uh, and maybe some we can get to Mountain View. But um, appreciate that. And the the first three chapters are introduction to the theme of social media networks, and then four, five, and six are very much how to do it, uh, walking you through the use of the tool, and then chapters 8 through 15 apply these things, and some of the examples I've shown you are from the book, uh, but, you know, there's ways to be able to study email and threaded networks, and then Twitter, Facebook, World Wide Web, Flickr, YouTube, and, and Wiki networks as well. And as we go down the road, we find, you know, lots of other groups that are interested for building a spigot. So that's sort of the natural thing. Then either they can work internally or we can uh, you know, make it public for them. Uh, the group itself is uh, supported from Microsoft External Research, um, but Maryland, Stanford, Cornell are involved in uh, this, Mark Smith, uh, and we formed the Social Media Research Foundation, which promotes open data, open tools, and open scholarship. So. Um, We'd like to hope that uh, Node Excel will be as widely used as you know other popular tools like Firefox and so on that are free and open on the net. And like the Mozilla Foundation or Linux Foundation, we think you know, we'd like to make these things open and accessible. That's our goal. And if you can help join us with that, that would be great. Um, I, just, I just like to just say we want to put all these things to good work to make the world a better place in ways such as helping the Millennium Development Goals. That can talk longer. And I just sort of close with saying we just had our 28th annual lab symposium. We had more than 250 people attending in a much larger format. And uh, the next event um, it will be the Summer Social Web Shop. We're bringing about 20, 25 speakers, about 40 students, doctoral students from around the country. And just Two days ago, I'm pleased to report that Google helps us along by sponsoring so we can bring some more students and speakers in. And it's mainly sponsored by National Science Foundation, but I'm real pleased. And you can visit our website there and see who the speakers are. And I hope you'll come join and find it to be a, you know, a, good, a good event. Um, so you know, the, the, the summary of this and the takeaway message is um, Networks have been around for a long time. Visualization of networks go back 75 years. Computerization of such network visualizations has 15, 20, 25 years of history. But only now, I mean, we and others are developing the strategies by which we can filter, do the layouts, and be able to interpret these data and apply statistical methods so that we can extract the insights that allow you to make important decisions. So we're quite excited about that. We're on to version 170 of Node Excel. We drop a new version about every two weeks or three weeks. Uh, and so it's a, a continuing satisfaction to see how that evolves. And we get, you know, there's just a lot of support and good people who are using it all around the world. So we're very pleased. Thank you for the opportunity. The books are here. I'd be glad to sign them for those who like. And I'm open for questions. Thank you. In the back, yes. Uh, no, I think that was the idea. We found the exist. Oh, oh, the question was, why do we choose Excel as the sort of platform? Um, the uh, answer is that 
all of us who had done network analysis with tools like UCI Net or Payek or any number of other tools, you wind up doing enormous amount of cleaning up and transforming and organizing the data. So it tends to be you're using some kind of spreadsheet or database, then you import to the visualization tool, you look at what you get and you say, oh, I need to go back and change that. You go back out you know, and you're going back and forth. This way we integrated the process, not perfectly, but we did integrate it in a platform that makes it go. We'd love to do it on Google Spreadsheet and make a web-based viewer. Uh, that would be a nice project to do together. Uh, we were sorely, very, let's put this, we're very eager to make a, a web-based version of this. And we have, you know, although we're very appreciative, I should say, of Microsoft Research for having supported this and, you know, for several years, uh, they encourage us and we are eager and I spoke at Mountain View in November about this, and I'm speaking here. Uh, we'd be delighted to have a partnership with Google. And if somebody wanted to pick up and help make a, you know, based on the Google you know, Docs spreadsheet and uh, a, a, a browser on the web, hey, that, that's very high on the list. Source is open, csharp.net. But that, uh, <laughs> that could change too, <laughs> right? We've included other platforms like Yuri Leskovich at Stanford has the SNAP toolkit, which is uh, algorithms to do very large networks. And uh, so we're happy to integrate those or work with other tools. We have no devotion to any particular platform or language. We'd love to see variations on this. Our current effort, I think, will bear fruit in a, a month or two will be to have a web browser for people who, if you're using uh, Node Excel, you export, it goes on the website, the image goes there, the data set goes there, and your explanation goes there. So, and then people can then download and browse it. So that will get us started with a web facing version. Uh, right now, you know, the, it's on the CodePlex website. There's a good discussion group. Uh, I must give high, high congrats, you know, thanks to Tony Capone, who's our lead developer, and he's done, you know, a remarkable job, and he also answers the questions quickly and very effectively. Uh, people really are very happy about, you know, becoming part of that user community. There's frustrations with it. There's all kinds of things we could talk about that we wish we had done or so on. And I can recommend other tools like Gephi. We're very good friends with them if you're looking at network drawing tools. They do a lot of nice things that we don't do. We do a lot of nice things they don't do. There's a lot of room for possibilities here. Uh, we keep exploring on the research side of what are the ways we can better extract meaningful insights from these network data sets. Thank you. Other questions here or elsewhere? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, Dan, thank you for sitting through the whole time. I see you out there too. Hope it was good uh, review. All right. It is excellent. <laughs> Thanks. See you again. And thank you all here. I appreciated my visit today and uh, look forward to talking more. Thank you. Bye.